allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So if we could begin with an approval of the minutes from December 16. If there are no questions or comments, I would ask for a motion to accept. Laura, I, I, have, have I have a bunch of comments, if I, if I may. This is Joe Krejci, Absolutely. I'm sorry. Go ahead, um, Joe. I, I, I guess the first thing, it's, it's my name. I guess my name is spelled incorrectly throughout the minutes. Okay. So, um, can you, can you I, let me just spell my. Yeah, you, you spell it K R A J C I. It appears in a number of the uh, of the minutes. Thank you for that, Joe. Okay, oh, yeah, and I have a couple of top. couple of others too, Laura, if, if I may. Yep, sure. Okay, there was one item where um, there was a talk about the different uh, looking at the charter. And there was a couple of, of references to look at. Yes. Which I think are uh, are mistakes. Yes. Um, the ones that I was just going to mention, Laura, was uh, 9.26, which talks about the town librarian. And I didn't think that had any application. And also there's a reference to 9.27, which is at least what Julia sent this no 9.27. And then there's a 10.18, which is the golf committee. So they're, so they're incorrectly listed. Exactly. I think, you know, we were just rattling off ones to look at. I would just recommend that you don't add, uh, include those three sections. Okay. Actually, it might just be easier just to remove the specific sections and just say something simple like, Julie recommended specific sections to look at. That's a good idea. Point, Loretta. Yep. Yeah, good. Okay. What else I, have, you have, I have a couple more. I know you guys are going to be think I'm a pain in the neck, but just in item three, there was areas of interest for the committee commission's focus. Yes. And there was something about reviewing the commission's charge. And I just, is charge the correct word? I think it is. Yes. Okay, okay, I, I just didn't, uh, fine. Okay, that, uh, that's, that's all I have, Laura. Oh, fab, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Laura, I know there was a question about me. It's Barbara. Um, I was at the October meeting for sure, but I wasn't at the December meeting. And so I think you have me present in December and a question whether I was there in October, but I was there in October. We had no meeting in November, right? right. And then December, I what happened, I maybe what the confusion was is I so I came on, but then I had a work conflict. And so I I wasn't really present. So I don't want to take credit for it. <laughs> now you're I'll muted. Look. Yeah. I have one more. In the on page 2 under Fairfield senior advocates, I'd like to amend the last line that says Mr. Lime cooler will attend the human services. January or February meeting just to cross off or February just so it says January meeting to further discuss initiatives. Just to clarify. Okay, Lori, do I have a motion to accept with changes? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Passed. Excellent. I don't know how I muted myself, but I did. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess we're going to move on to Herb's presentation before we go to our business at hand. So I want to introduce Herb Lime Cooler, who has been a, a fearless advocate of our Human Services Commission 
for many, many years and behind the scenes gives us so much fantastic data, um, sets up meetings for us where and when appropriate. Obviously with COVID, those have not been available to us except by telephone calls. So we thank you, Herb, for always being proactive and bringing us fabulous information for us to consider, of which this one in particular, Fairfield Senior or um, Fairfield Age Friendly uh, Environments, which we all received the PowerPoint. Um, I was able to look through it. It's 26 pages, so I didn't print it. But um, I hope everybody else had an opportunity to look through it. And um, I think John Wynn is here to assist you in this fabulous presentation to enlighten us into this new initiative that we hope Fairfield will soon bring aboard. So if you could, Herb, go ahead and enlighten us. Okay, well, listen, thanks for the kind words, Laura. Um, uh, my um, more illustrious colleague, John Wynn, is, is with us also, and John and I will, will co-present today. And I think you know John is, has having done a great job in terms of leading this strategic planning effort for the town. He's, act, he's now a member of the Charter uh, Commission. I know that's, that's on your agenda for uh, later today as well. So um, delighted to have John uh, with, with, with me today. Yeah, great. So we were going to, to um, continue the discussion of the overall areas in which um, Fairfield Senior Advocates is involved. And, and and maybe take one page to do that. And uh, of course, we can take any questions that, that anyone has now or, or later. You can certainly always reach us with questions, but we'll can take questions. And then we wanted to spend most of the time we hoped on the age friendly um, on the age friendly presentation. And and John uh, John will lead that all for us, and then I'll come in, and then we'll 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 work together on on that one. So. Um, I think what I want to do then is to share my screen. So um, let me see if I can do that. I think you just have to hit that share button. Right. So uh, I'm going to hit the share button, and then I'm going to move to to my uh, to the first document, which is the um, which should be. Sorry, it's here. Uh, it's the, um, can everybody see this one now? No. Oh. No, okay. Let me go back to Zoom and hit share. Um, how about that? Can we see yeah. that one? Okay. Yeah. You can see it. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. All right. So, um, so these are the focus areas for Fairfield Senior Advocates in 2022. And as we've said, you know, many times we are, and I know we've got some new members too, so um, maybe a little bit more background otherwise in to that regard, but we've been around for about six years now. We're a grassroots a nonpartisan a group uh, that works at the town and state level. And our mission is to make life better for seniors in the town and state and to keep them, uh, to, to keep them uh, for, for their benefit and for the benefit of you know, their families, our families, and also it benefits, it benefits all of our finances, everyone in the town, if we can keep our, our seniors. So, um, we work in a number of different areas, and these are our focus areas for 2022. So there are other areas that we'll be working in that we have worked in, but these are the areas that we'll be really concentrating our efforts uh, in 2022. There's nothing that's more important than what we do uh, than and what we do that than housing, and uh, so we're actively involved in terms of working on the revised affordable housing plan that. Um, that is to be in place by the end of May. Uh, they're actually we're, we're working toward a public hearing at mid May on that. So Carrie Macover of our group is a formal member of the commission and and Bob Ellwinger and I work 
you know, as sort of the adjunct members working closely with the committee and supporting them with 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 uh, with data and and questions and whatnot and comments. Um, also, um, what just happened this week is uh, the town uh, the, the town had a, a the public the planning and zoning commission had a a hearing uh, to take public comment on further expanding the eligibility for accessory dwelling units. Uh, you might remember that about a year or so ago, um, in response to recommendations that, that, that FSA, Fair Plan, and the Affordable Housing Committee made, uh, the, um, the commission took steps to expand that eligibility. They've, they've suggested further expansion, and we've spoken in favor of that, of that further expansion uh, this week. It would mean detached uh, dwelling, detached units in more parts of the town. It would also mean uh, further expansion of, um, of, uh, of, of ADU eligibility in different zones uh, beyond the ones that were initially, uh, initially approved. Um, so we'll see what the commission act, uh, see what the commission does in terms of, of taking the next step, but, but it's a, uh, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, uh a hearing that we were happy to participate in and, and gratified by their, their real interest in, in ADUs. And then the other bullet here, um, part of, of our effort at housing, and, and we, we, we've emphasized this in connection with the affordable housing plan and hope that the plan will address this, but it's having more housing options uh, for seniors, for millennials, for, for everyone in town than what we have right now. That's, that, that's, to us is, 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 is almost as important as the affordable housing and, uh, and it needs to be stressed. And so we're using the, the, the plan revision as well as, as other means of, of trying to uh, advance that, that cause. We're very active in the state legislature. This is the busy time of the year for that. And uh, it's probably premature for us to be able to recommend uh, a comprehensive series of pandemic best practices um, this time, because we're still we're still working to try to get consensus uh, among legislators and other groups toward that. But we're gathering information, doing research, talking with legislators, learning as much as we can, working with groups like AARP and SWACA to to formulate ideas. Formulate ideas. We're also working to um, to support um, other initiatives that groups like SWACA and AARP are advocating that will help. Uh, protect uh, vulnerable seniors uh, in particular. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch and, and let you know more about that as we get into the legislature. The, the um, um, uh, opening day is, is, is February 9th, I think, and um, the bill for, for uh, the deadline for bills to come out of committee is, is I think February 25th, 24th or 25th. Um, Community Mr. data study. I have a question yeah. regarding that. So, when you say comprehensive pandemic best practices at the state level, is that what you're saying, or right. local? State. Uh, no, state. Yes. This is all. This is all state legislation, Laura. Okay. So, how would that, um, you know, drill down to us as a human services commission locally? Well, I mean, I, I think what we're concerned about in particular, for instance, is is what happened during during the current, beginning of the current pandemic, and the fact that that you know we as well as other jurisdictions weren't fully prepared. Um, so we, what we'd like to do is to make sure that we've learned from from any mistakes. Uh, we we adapt, uh, adopt lessons learned, and we do all we can to be prepared the next time. Uh, whether that means in terms of protocols and nursing homes or just management practices generally. So we, we want to be part of this effort. And obviously, this isn't going to be a FSA initiative uh, without working with, all, with a lot of other groups and legislators. But so this, this, would be, this would be statewide legislation, statewide practices, even maybe not, not needing to be embedded in legislation, maybe in, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, Executive actions, but it would be statewide statewide actions. Okay, thank you. Okay. We talked last time about data and the fact that we have developed a, 
kind of a unique database by merging the voter and the assessor databases. And, and so we're going to be looking for opportunities to, to share that information and work with decision makers on a, on a, on a, on a stage basis um, this year. And uh, we're really excited, as I mentioned the last time, and I think it's actually alluded to in, in the minutes that, that, um, that, 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 that Sheila and, 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 and Joe uh, cited, is, um, is um, the, the fact that um, we now have data by household. So we're in a position to really understand household composition. Uh, we, we didn't have that capability uh, the first two years that we did this, this merge. So we're excited about this data in terms of learning, you know, more about where seniors live, what their vulnerabilities, what the opportunities might be, um, you know, given the information that we've been able to put together. So more on that later. Um, I won't say too much about the age friendly initiative now, because that's really the main event now, but what we've listed here are our year 1 type initiatives. You know, some of the things that we would be wanting to address to to help work with ours, others in getting things launched in earnest. Um, get the project staffed and, and begin the, the overall outreach and information collection processes. And then finally, communications and outreach. Um, we began um, in person meetings at Bigelow Center 2 years ago, just before the pandemic. We were also doing them at the library and um, we hope to resume them again. In fact, we, we do have a, a meeting scheduled on, on February 23rd um, at, at, the, at the Bigelow Center. So we're excited about that as a, as a 1st in person meeting since the pandemic. And um, we, but we want, do want to continue with our, our. Our selected video sessions that we began in March of 20, 2020, um, very shortly after the pandemic began. And I think we'll be looking for some new twists to make those as relevant, as interesting, and as short as possible. Uh, and then finally, I think we want to continue to work on communication and engagement. We do need to find more um, active members in FSA. Uh, we have, you know, a limited number of us that are sort of carrying the load we could really do a lot more if we could expand our um, you know our, our, our active force so that's kind of a quick overview of of, of our initiatives uh, and um, um, any any other questions at this point before John leads this into uh, into age friendly and, uh, this is Marty Schwartz, uh, and I'm, I'm new to this, so you're probably already doing some of the things that I'm asking about, but uh, it looks like you're looking to engage more seniors and providing getting input from those seniors. Just wondering if you've ever done or thought about doing a survey now that you're able to identify, I guess, pretty well where seniors live, their addresses, et cetera. Marty, great question. Um, we did a survey that was driven uh, by housing and living needs about three or four years or so ago. And we, we didn't get, we did not get the, the total uh, level of response that we really had hoped to, to obtain. Uh, we, and and that, that information is a little bit dated now. So I think it does behoove us to do uh, surveys like that. Um, actually, as part of the age friendly process, and we could talk a bit about this during that, um, surveys would be done of the, of the overall community, you know, seniors, but but beyond seniors, to really gauge what what's important, what's uh, what's needed, um, a gauge how many people intend to live their lives out in Fairfield versus relocating, um, a whole series of inf information we gather on senior attitudes and interests. So I think that's really an, another opportunity for us to get further into. Uh, into uh, into surveying our, our, our residents. And, and one other Thank point you. to that survey is uh, in the past four years, the frequency of their use and the capability, the types of tools that you can use to do it and the data you can harvest out of the surveys have come, become much more sophisticated and much more easy to use um, so that what we were able to do many several years ago with surveys, we can enhance now with more people being willing to provide input in surveys and then us being able to analyze the data that we gather during that survey process. Yeah. That sounds good. Hey, Herb, this is Joe Krejci. I, I just have a, a quick uh, clarification. 
when you talk about the affordable housing, uh, you're addressing it in the context of just seniors. Is that correct? No, no. This is uh, this is a uh, yeah, the affordable housing uh, committee ad addresses the needs of, of of all of everyone, all ages. Oh, no, I know that, but I mean, your particular. Are you just addressing the seniors, or are you addressing the whole issue of affordable housing? No, we're addressing the whole issue of affordable housing. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, anything else before we move on then? All right. Terrific. Uh, I'm going to, to uh, bring up the, um, the age friendly. Then yep. everybody still with us. It's up on the screen. So that's great. Do you want me to take over herb with just describing the, the material and the, the area and, and then we'll figure out where for me to pass the baton to you on. Kind of going through the details. Sure. Okay. So, uh, this information regarding age friendly, just a little bit of context. Herb mentioned, you know, some of the initiatives I've been involved with here in town. 1 of which was the strategic planning effort. In that effort, um, we held what we called subject matter expert sessions. Where we brought in people that had knowledge and understanding and expertise on a variety of different topics. 1 of them involved herb and Julie and several other people and Julie, with her knowledge and experience, brought some great insights and information to. To that strategic planning effort and herb and I continued to work with that as part of our both of our roles with Fairfield senior advocates. So big kudos to Julie to. Be knowledgeable about this and bring the material. So we had a good discussion and the consultants we were working with were very impressed with this area as something to really think about to, to further evolve how the town goes through. So we have this material, it's about 29 pages. I know one or two participants might just be participating by phone, not looking at the material, but I think we can guide you through what page we're looking at. So if you actually have the material that Julie sent out with us, you'll be able to follow along what we're talking about. And after the, the meeting today, this presentation, which is 29 pages, um, is fairly summary and succinct. You can read through it and understand, I'm sure, many of the points that are being presented in the material. So with that, um, the deck is um, has two sections to it. One is an executive summary, so it's first four or five page or six pages, and then the other twenty summer twenty pages gets into much more detail uh, about it. So the the page that's up now is the uh, second page of it. It's the overview. It identifies the sections that we'll go through, which are an introduction to age friendly, how to go about planning for an age friendly initiative, which is what we're, we're really talking about materials and resources to leverage in the process, what a draft high level vision for Fairfield on this topic might be, uh, and then some other further details. So um, that's kind of the set of topics that we'll, we'll go through in, in the 29 pages or so, although we won't spend time on every single page. So let's go to the next page, Herb. So we, let's start off by describing what age friendly means. And it's built upon a framework that was developed with the World Health Organization and AARP, and they've been working in this area for a while. There's several different domains um, that the overriding goal of which is to make a more livable community uh, for seniors. But what we, we endorse is to involve more than just seniors in it, because it's not just seniors that participated in this, in this, it's families that have seniors as part of their household, it's multi-generational families. The real objective is to ensure that there's inclusion, access, equity, and safety and support for everyone in the community. And this approach of eight different domains describing age-friendly can be tailored based upon the needs and capabilities of each different community. Um, but it's really an integrated type of framework. Um, let's go to the next page, Herb. And I know many of you may have questions, so let's go through the executive summary pages. We'll pause and see if there's a question or two before we dive into the detail. Um, so the, the next, this page has kind of a, a left to right multi-year approach for going about um, 
implementing, defining, and then implementing an initiative. And we're at the very beginning of this. If you look at the left-hand side of this page, and the types of things that we need to do to really go about the work for the first year or so in planning what it would mean is to establish that there is a desire and interest in doing something like this, evaluate the needs of the, uh, of the community and what capabilities are in place, and then gain commitment from residents, from elected officials, from support networks, social services, religious organizations, um, and get the best robust type of feedback to, to push the initiative forward. After you plan and you begin to structure some of the work, you go through some implementation steps, which is which are usually a little bit further along the you know latter part of the first year and into the second year. Uh, you evaluate your progress and you continuously have a circle back continuous improvement type of loop. It looks intimidating, you know, a multi-year type of initiative. Um, but there, there's a lot of work that's been done by other communities that we can leverage to achieve quicker results, better initial structure for an initiative like this. How about we go to the next page, Erwin? So, as I mentioned, many communities have, you know, moved down this path and they've made the commitment to make their communities age friendly. They are our communities in uh, New York, in Massachusetts, in, in several in Connecticut. Um, the types of resources we would leverage are things that they may have done to define the program objectives, the objective by different domains, each area, action plans, the organizational structure they put into place to help structure, manage, and execute it, and techniques for gaining community engagement and input, which would be include things like surveys, workshops, listening sessions, variety of different types of things. The real effort is to leverage the thought leadership that's in place to develop an age-friendly plan that will provide us benefits, which we, we mentioned here, which is, you know, stem the outflow of seniors and retain more seniors, provide better support and services, uh, achieve financial benefits of doing performing an initiative like this, and, and many others that we'll understand better and define as we, we go through this process. So let's let's go to the next page, Herb. So what we developed is a draft vision for what age friendly might mean for Fairfield. And what we have here, it's a draft. It's something that that Herb and I and uh, several other members of FSA contributed to. It's just a starting point. Your thoughts and inputs on this would be very helpful. And then we can you know further adapt it as we continue to structure and roll an initiative like this out uh, into fairfield but it's really demonstrating that fairfield is committed to becoming an age-friendly community recognizing the tangible and specific benefits of doing an age-friendly initiative and then to really focus on efforts to retain our seniors and better engage our residents uh, to have you know, family and finance, family and, you know, intergenerational beneficial um, results for the family, financial benefits, intergenerational understanding of respect and support, which is kind of needed now where we're kind of in a, a, a fractured country in, in some respects. So, again, just an initial view of what a vision for an age friendly Fairfield might be. So, let's go to the uh, here we just define some guiding principles, which again, we would, we would want to spend more time to better understand everyone's viewpoints on what kind of guiding principles will help us achieve the best result in structuring and then executing an age friendly initiative. So, this is the point where the executive summary is done um, before we go into details, any initial questions or. I have a question, John. It's Laura. Is there a cost for this? Um, right. Some communities have made an investment and, and funded this with different types of approaches. Um, it, the best result for, from our research on this indicates that town department people are involved. But the question is, you know, is this just something that they do 
or participate in, and it's already part of some of the programs and initiatives they have in place. So there's a cost to execute. It's not fully clear, and there maybe you have a perspective on this, uh, on you know how communities have looked at the costs versus the benefits. Um, but as far as becoming an age-friendly community and working within AARP or, or uh, the framework, I don't think there's any cost to join. Um, it's just um, you know, demonstrating a commitment to doing, doing a, an initiative that is focused on age-friendliness. Right. Yeah, and there, 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 there is no, what? sorry, there, there is no cost, Laura, um, as, as John indicated. Uh, some towns have made modest investments in, in getting uh, individuals to help them with the plan. Let's say in terms of, of capturing data, like a profile of information. Um, now, we have access to the two universities in town that we think we think could really help us with this. And, you know, John and I could certainly work in terms of the skills that we have and have developed. Uh, to 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 support this effort, so we're not sure that we would even need to make some of the we, we'd have some of the again modest costs that that some of the other towns uh, expended, but there is no cost, and the, the only real cost, I guess, as John alluded, is is the opportunity cost. In other words, it's if we have town departments working with us, town department heads could be doing something else during the time they work with us, but there, there's there's no there's no basic required cost here. Um, another, another, um, uh, I had a question, if I may. It's uh, Rabbi Barbara. Um, I, I'm sorry if I'm naive and, and not really understanding, but I guess as a commissioner, I've been on the commission, you know, for, uh, I don't know, maybe two years. And, you know, one of the issues that always comes up is what we want to be doing as commissioners to really move things forward. And Unfortunately, you know, every time we had tried to plan a retreat or whatever, as Laura well knows, you know, then COVID struck and, and we haven't really all sat together to, to do some visioning. But I'm trying to pit, understand better all the pieces, like how do you see the commission, um, the senior Bigelow Center, the, you know, how do the pieces fit together? to make this happen, because obviously I think you need buy-in from as many different, you know, entities as, as can be out there. So, you know, it just sounds to me that this is a great thing, but how does it come to fruition, I guess? Uh, you know, how do you then do the nuts and bolts of it? It can't all be from the Fairfield senior advocates. I think you need, you know, the the rest of us and uh i don't know even maybe julie has some thoughts on what her role and her you know would be but can you say just a drop more about that to clarify because i'm confused of uh you know where where this all all the pieces come is that a fair question or uh great question go, go ahead john i was gonna say it's it's a, it is a great question and it is a big undertaking if you look at that uh, the, the second page which defines what aid friendly is but if you break it down into its underlying elements there's various issues like housing social interaction community support and health services and i could see and I, I don't want to define it for any of you but if any of you were interested as individuals and residents uh, in participating and working on any one of the initiatives, I could see a role for someone who is on the Human Services Commission lending their knowledge and expertise on a topic to one of these areas. It's not to say that any one individual needs to be involved in every single one of the areas, because I think the breadth of knowledge that you would need to have would be immense. And uh, just would be very impressive for someone to participate in every one of them. But if someone like yourself was interested in participating either as a lead on a domain or as a member of a team working on a topic for community support and health services or social participation, I could see someone with your background and, and a religious affiliation with um, being interested in that and having immense skills to contribute to the effort, but not to say that you would need to lead it. It's, and, uh, you know, I presented 
some of my prior work to the Human Services Commission, um, and I know it covers multi multiple facets, some of which align nicely with the domains and some of which maybe cross over between several of them. So that's my perspective. Now, see, Julie, you're muted, Julie. Okay. Yep. Thanks for giving me more work, John. <laughs> and now you make me feel guilty. <laughs> But Stu, if I may, um, and Herb, hopefully I'm not jumping in and cutting you off. The exciting and daunting thing about this project is that the entire community needs to be engaged from every department to, you know, houses of worship to community organizations to chamber of commerce to stores. It's, you know, it's, it's the beginning tasks of finding, you know, finding people to work on those 8 domains or however many domains an advisory board would come up with, you know, I would hope that there might be some commissioners who are interested in serving, whether even if it's to just to advise or to actually participate in leading and also with our new commission on disabilities. So it's a great opportunity town wide. It's not a, it's not a human services thing alone. It's not a FSA thing alone, but it's, it really is having a neighborhood associate. It's having the entire town buy in and see how important it is because everybody's goal is to become a senior and that doesn't start at 65. That's, you know, that starts now for, you know, for young families. And it's, I think it's a really exciting and um, daunting project. So Julie, it's Laura. Thank you for that. Um, I guess my question too is so that it doesn't necessarily involve hiring somebody in the town to manage it no definitely not definitely not yeah sorry sorry Julie. It, it's more of a committee that manages it that's yeah, it would appointed be by, by the selectmen or just is created i don't know i'm, I'm curious how does that maybe mary ellen gavin actually can give us more input because she actually was involved in greenwich when it all came to Pass, right, Mary Ellen, if I'm not mistaken. No, I wasn't I wasn't involved, but I followed it very closely in Greenwich. I think it's okay. an incredible, I think it's an incredible program. Um I, it, Greenwich really hit it out of the ballpark a couple, I think they implemented it maybe eight years ago or so, or started the process eight years ago. Um, and they did a fabulous job. I believe um yes. and I don't know if this is I, I don't want to speak out of term or be incorrect on this, but I believe there's grant money available to pay for some of these initiatives once you dig into the weeds. Right now, this presentation is going over the whole overview of the program, um, to your point, Rabbi. Um, and later on, I think we'll be digging into the weeds as to each of those eight different pockets and where you need the assistance. So, Laura, to your specific question on page five of the material, the fourth item over on the top part of the page talks about organizational structure. That's really the, the question you're asking. Is this town defined by a town commission? Is this uh, defined by the organizational structure of a volunteer organization? How do you go about doing it? That's what we would be thinking about in organizational structure and what's the best structure and approach and what have we seen with other communities that have been successful and how they've structured it. And I would say it's yes to all of it. It's a combination. It's something we would need to define as a community because we're a little bit different, yet very similar to many of the other communities that, that have moved down this path. Thank and Irv, I think we cut you off earlier when we were talking about costs and a few other things. So I, I didn't want to make sure we benefited from your thoughts on this before you take us through the rest of the material. I think, you know, m minor costs, if any, and, and, and as Mary Ellen said, some towns have actually gotten grants that have helped to cover those costs. And we've been talking, you know, in depth with, uh, we've spent hours actually talking with a couple of the Massachusetts towns that are, you know, you know, you know, well down the process. Uh, and uh, Julie spent uh, substantial time uh, talking with Greenwich and we're going to continue to talk with as many towns as we, as we can to learn as much as we can about what works and what, what's worked for them, you know, ad adapt their, their lessons learned and make it as smooth a path for us as we can. Great. Okay, so we'll, we'll um, talk a little bit about the details here and we won't cover every page, but um, so, so jo John, jump in here um, as, as you see fit. I'll, I'll um, 
Um, this is just an outline of some things we're, we're going to, to touch base here. I think we, we alluded to some of these before, but um, um, we're going to talk about how communities become age friendly again and and what other towns have done, you know, where age friendly exists, what age friendly is and is not. So let's let's just jump jump right in here. Um, now this is the this is the um, we've already looked at this one, haven't we? Yeah, we, we, we covered the vision very high level. So that's yeah. on page 10 for those following just on the phone. Page 10 in the materials. And the guiding principles, I think, are uh, right I, behind it. So this is yeah, page right 11. We'll skip, 11. We'll skip through those. And for instance, uh, Greenwich has, uh, has, a, um, has a vision, a short vision statement. And then they've got five guiding principles that, they, that, that they've structured you know these are you know one or two sentence statements that 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 drive their activity and um and you know we'll, we'll look to build this out over time but it's not something we would try to do ourselves obviously we're, we're just one participant we need to get us a, a, a you know a whole group of volunteers involved in terms of, of forming this and you know and it's something that'll be subject to sub Bird, to if you might, I mean, my name is Suzanne Testani. um Everybody, everybody there. I can still hear you. Okay. Yes. Good. So, so, so the next, um, so we, and we've also covered this slide as well. This is slide 12 now, I think. There are 8 standard domains of services. However, many communities have modified these. Uh, they've, they've, uh, they've taken some of the domains and then they've, they've bunched them. Or broken them out. They've added dementia friendly in some cases as a separate domain. Um, the the head of, of age friendly in Massachusetts, whom, with whom I've spoke several times, told me that uh, at least one town or one or more towns has added a, a domain on uh, safety and security. Uh, he said some of the towns haven't haven't uh, moved ahead with all uh, eight domains. In fact. They may be focused in on several, just two or three domains and moved ahead, which he said has been fine. So it's the key thing is really what works for Fairfield, what's right for what's right for us uh, in terms of uh, of, of, of staking, uh, you, know, you know, staking the, the, the project in terms of what we're trying to accomplish and then structuring how we would accomplish it. Um, now, what does age friendly not mean? Um, it's not. Retirement villages, it's not nursing homes or assisted living or planned communities, age restricted. It's none of that. It's 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 a broad intergenerational effort to make aging more uh, uh, friendly, uh, easy, uh, accepted uh, in 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 Fairfield and. Julie told us yesterday that then in Greenwich, they're reaching out in terms of their studies. To people age 45 uh, and above in terms of actively participating. I'm sure if someone is 35 and wants to participate, they're welcome. But this is all about not just taking care of seniors. This is about making making aging better, easier, um, you know, more welcome uh, across the across the uh, the generations. Now, many communities nationally are, are involved in age friendly in Massachusetts. This has become a hit. Uh, the number is now 94, 94 Massachusetts communities. Um, are, are, are in the network. The state of uh, uh, the, the Commonwealth is, is, it, is in itself. Uh, a, a member of the age friendly network. We've spoken with Salem at length. We've spoken with, um, um, uh, it looks like Chelmsford. Like they call it Chelmsford up there, uh, but we've we've talked with uh, we've talked with Chelmsford. Um, Julie's talked talked at, at at length with with Greenwich, and we want to have more conversation with them. They were the first in in our state. The other communities in Connecticut are Glastonbury, Groton, Newtown, and Simsbury. So it's actually five right now. We need to update this. We had gotten. Different information, but it's actually five right now for the uh, AERP website. The three G's: Glastonbury, Groton, um, 
Greenwich, uh, Newtown, and Simsbury. We have a contact in Glastonbury that we're going to pursue as well. Um, John talked through the process before. Um, we're, we're early in the game, so we're now looking to reach out to people uh, to get involved, to, to form a core group that, that works to put together a, a process for gathering information. And that gathering information would consist of listening sessions and a survey and, and a data profile. And as we talk to more and more people, then we would be able to, to really formulate what our strategies would look like. But we can't get there until we, we get you know, a, a core group involved to do some work in the beginning and then reach out to our, to our population. Um, so, John, did we, did we talk through this slide before? Um, no, page 17, we did not, um, we didn't, we didn't, we, we talked about it, I think, but so, so, so Brenda, um, has been very supportive of this. And in fact, when, when Brenda was, was campaigning two years ago, and we met with her actually two and a half years ago now, we mentioned this concept to her. I think John did, and she really really bought into it. In fact, when I, Julie and I met with her uh, in September to, to, to confirm her interest, she reminded, uh, she reminded me of that meeting and how she was really enthused about the concept, which shocked me that she had remembered that and then she had bought into it. Um, so this is required commitment, you know, from the chief town official. As John said before, it's a multi-year action plan that requires gathering a lot of information um, you know, written survey, listening sessions, focus groups as, as we deem appropriate, and wide engagement, town departments, businesses, community groups, nonprofits, businesses, residents, um, the, the more the merrier. Um, the domains, um, I, I think, you know, John showed the domains and, um, they're, 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 we've talked and we've, when we talk with some of these other towns, we've talked about specific domains and what's been important to them. And we have copies of their action plans to really be able to drill down in terms of what they view as particularly important. Some think transportation is really critical. One developed a, a new transportation system um, that provided door to door service in, in their town as an outgrowth of this. Another thinks housing is really critical. Several think housing is really critical and they need to make uh, progress in terms of more options uh, for residents. Um, talked about public safety, that one, one, um, one, one town, one or more towns has developed that as a, as a specific domain. Um, so, you know, these are, all, these are all important factors in terms of living, um, they're intergenerational. And um, what we find to be the most important for our residents is what we would want to build together, would want to build into these domains and also these specific action plans. It's town specific. That's the way it's designed to be. I have a quick question for John. John, how does this run in tandem with the strategic plan or does it not? Well, there was one in the strategic plan, one big recommendation that centered around what was described as a smile, a senior and millennial integrated living environment. Many of the elements of that are exactly consistent with the age friendly um, initiative, such as this, because it, it dealt with um, housing, location of services, uh, you know, variety of different things that are centered around that. This is a little bit more comprehensive than just the, um, the uh, elements of the strategic plan, I, I, I would say. Um, so, you know, the strategic plan really was major initiatives that we need to undertake. This is a way to make many of the day-to-day -day things that we all experience much more beneficial to our, you know, enriching our life here. They may, it may not 
the strategic plan types of, of, of things, but one big impact is it could make our community more desirable for people to remain here and live here or move here, which is a big objective of strategic of a strategic plan. So Laura, and just in, in, in complimenting John's response, um, what I put up here is, and this is this was not in the draft that we initially sent to you. We, we've we've enhanced this. So I went and looked at, uh, you know, a, a, another town that I thought was similar to ours, and I looked at their domain objectives, and, and I and I considered what I thought was important to us, and I actually did an updated draft. Again, this is just illustrative. If you look in this, you will see a lot. Concepts that are really embedded in the strategic plan, you know, making the town more walkable, for instance, uh, promoting transportation, housing references. So there really are a lot of things that, that are likely, that, while they aren't, in many cases, immediate tenants that fall right out of the strategic plan, you, you, I think you'll see a lot of commonality between, between, you know, threads in the strategic plan. And what we would likely, I would suspect, again, this is a lot of what we would likely deem to be, you know, important as far as our domain objectives. Urban, and this is how this is Loretta. May I also be back on to Laura's question with, um, are you aware, you're aware of the racial equity and justice task force blueprint that recently, was just released this month? As that's another model to improve and enhance our community and make it more inclusive, have you explored, gone through that, explored that, and looked to incorporate some of the recommendations into this plan? So we haven't gotten to that level of detail at this point, Loretta. But certainly, that's one of the groups that we would want to have engaged. And certainly, your committee, uh, we would very much want to have engaged in this process. That that, that, that would, they would be imperative that they would be part of this. Very good. Terrific, thank you. It appears to me, and I'm, I'm speaking out loud here what I'm thinking, but it appears to me it just seems to be a wonderful coming together of so many things that face a town or you know a city that people can quickly gain insight and overview when you know newspapers are no longer available, who's reading online or not reading online. It's kind of like a great information cycle, but how would it be imparted only by computer? Well, um, it, it, and, and that's really up to the town, uh, Laura, but uh, in, in some towns, for instance, in Greenwich, for instance, uh, printable materials, printable transportation schedules, printable information was, was included as one of the objectives in the communication domain. Um, so, I think it can be whatever we think is is appropriate for us. Expanded town website, you know, um, wh whatever is right for us, we should we should look to engage. And the answer the answer to that question today might be a different answer than what it would be in five years, because as we all age, we all are engaging in technology answers and solutions and possibly using less of the newspaper types of things. That doesn't mean we shouldn't address how we communicate and disseminate information and get information um, from a, the manual approach um, today because so many people still use that. But five or 10 years from now, that may be quite different than where we are right now. Thank you. So I just wanted to put these up for for illustration. Uh, these these are basically would be demand domain strategy statements. They're the key components, and then behind. So, so for illustration here, we had seven domains, but this doesn't really immediately address age friendly and. Yeah, again, our domains are to be determined whatever we think is appropriate, but once you develop, you know, for for every domain strategy, there would be action plans. So, for instance, Greenwich had said, well, we're going to have, we're going to focus on no more than three domain strategies. And, and for every domain strategy, 
there may be up to three domain action steps. So for every action step, there would be, you know, goals, timeframes. We have potential partners that will be working on a domain. So this again, this is just illustrative, but say on outdoor spaces, you might want to have the committee on disabilities involved and and public works and police and fire and and rec. And it might be a slightly different, you know, core group of, of engaged partners. Not that anyone's excluded from any, but on transportation, it might be somewhat different. It might be social services and the Committee on Disabilities again and Metrocog and and private transport orgs and and outside transportation experts that, that maybe are in the community. So it you know it it would be it would be allocating resources, partner resources to work on building out these these action steps. And again, this is all illustrative, but it's based on what's what seems to be working in terms of other towns. So um, I'm mindful of the time, but we want to quickly finish up here. Um, but um, I, I, again, it's it's a it's a range of people that would be involved, and um, uh, you know, and you know, so of course we're talking about you know all of our you know boards and commissions and 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 the academic institutions and and. Uh, uh, Community coalitions and individual residents, volunteers, a, a large, large participation would be needed to really make it make it work and work effectively and be and be sustainable. So, um, you know, once, as John said before, you know, once we, we get through the, we're, we're, it's, we're in the early stages. Uh, once we would get through the, um, once we would get through the, um, uh, you know, the initial stage, we're in the network, we, we, the action planning process would begin, we, you know, the data information stage would begin, then we would build action plans, and we would, we would seek approval uh, from AARP, and then we would, we would be off into implementation. And we've got a slide behind this that actually talks about key checkpoints. Um, this is... Um, I actually adapted this from uh, from from the town of, uh, of Chelmsford. Um, they told me no L, Julie. Um, uh, so the, the town of Chelmsford, and and um, this is sort of some of the some of the milestones that that they went through. And you know, some of these are are optional, some are mandatory. We don't. The third one isn't required. We don't have to have someone from the AARP come in and give a presentation. Um, they have videos they've made available. Um, it's, it's helped some communities. Um, it may or may not be, be needed be needed here based upon the information that we have. But this is a series of, of checkpoints that that worked for that town, and in, in some level of uh, in some level of detail. And um, um, you know, potential partners that, that come to mind and they, they can really make a big impact, certainly the two universities, uh, as well as as well as businesses and nonprofits and other organizations. And uh, there's a, there are a lot of resources that we are leaning on and can lean on going forward to give us to give us support um, as well. So um is any other questions that we can we can take and you know we can certainly we'll certainly be happy to keep you all up to date in terms of what um, of what um, we learned but but is there is there more at this point in time additional questions that we can respond to so that sounds so very comprehensive it, it's it's an amazing plan you did incredible work um so you're envisioning envisioning that um, in five years this will be up and going and and alive and well and functioning well. For four years or three years, a three to five years that's a big a big window. You know what I mean? So it is, and it's deliberately designed to allow time, so that we aren't rushing things. That we're getting input from everyone in an organized structured way we're building, building coalitions everyone feels like they can be part of it 
Um, yeah, Mary Ellen, it's, it's, I, I think we're certainly capable of doing it with, and one of the keys would be really getting support from, um, from a, a broad group of, of, in the community in terms of, 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 of supporting, you know, engaging and also agreeing to, to, to help in the work because, because there is a lot of work. But there's really an opportunity, I think, for us to make a real difference, a real meaningful, uh, enduring difference here. And that's why I think we, we're all really excited about it. It's amazing. You did amazing work, really. I just, I'm just thinking of all the, the uh, super elderly out there that have been falling through the cracks and you know, the three to five years, many of them will be gone by then. Do you know what I mean? So, um, you know, how, how do we help them? So I guess that's our job. Sure. Absolutely. So, uh, and j just, you know, there are a lot of ancillary benefits that come. And I think this is an interesting page here. Well, I won't try to go through every point here, but in addition to, you know, building inter 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 intergenerational, um, uh, you know, connectedness in the, in the town, there, there are a lot of, of, uh, of really ancillary benefits that, that come that we really will, I think, be, be useful and helpful for, for us as a, as a town. It's Julie, can I jump in for a sec? I, I think for us, the next step for this commission is to look over the materials that Herb and John presented and um, get a sense of whether or not you want to jump in. You know, this is it's commission is, a, is an important part of this. And if there's an area that you're interested in focusing on or serving on an advisory as an, on a, as an advisory capacity, that would be fantastic. Um, it's it's no pressure, but it's a great opportunity to participate. Um, Greenwich is in the third third year, I think, of this process. I think that's right, and um, it it gets renewed or refreshed every five years. So they're looking at starting again in 2024. So this is an ongoing opportunity for the town to to reassess every five years about what's working, what's not, what's been accomplished, what can be accomplished, how technology changes. I mean, it has long-term implications and it would be great if um, some of you wanted to jump in and participate. Thank you, Julie. I was gonna ask, can we add this as a discussion item to next month's agenda so that the commission can kind of, you know, like you say, review what we've, you know, learned today and, um, you know, come back and um, give our assessment and like you say, who would want to be involved, who wouldn't. Because I mean, it just from what I'm seeing and hearing here, it, it seems very appropriate that you, the Human Services Commission would lead a charge like this because it involves so much of the town in, in you know, a social services way. Um, but I don't know. That would be up for discussion amongst our commission, I would think to see. Well, part of it is that it, I think it would be because it's town wide. I think each commission that um, represents different departments in town will hopefully be engaged with it. Um, you know, we'll have definitely have a big role in it. Um, once once we get it kicked off, I, I think we'll be better able to see it. But having people from human services commission commissioners on on that advisory or heading up, you know, some of those domains would be a huge help. I think one of the keys is is getting a lot of people involved initially, and then let's you know let's let the cream rise to the top and see who really are the effective leaders. So one of the bits of advice that I got was, you know, don't feel that you need to designate people that lead these domains right out of the box. See who really contributes, who really brings vision and and work to the effort, and and it, it'll the decision will, will help will be made by itself over time in terms of. Of seeing how it all plays out, but we really do need to get that core group involved so that we can do planning and outreach and and really sort of manage things going forward. Excellent. It's a lot of work. Is your presentation finished, or is yes, that we're, it? We're, absolutely, uh, done. That was excellent. Really, so much time and effort put in. Thank you so much. I'm sure yeah, everybody can agree how helpful this has been. Really, yeah. and and how much it really does kind of tie in with the charter as well in some ways. I mean, uh, there's you know charges that are in that charter that seem to align well with 
things that are outlined here. So thank you. Perfect. That was, thank you. Yeah. On, could you do me a favor on the share button? Um, relinquish control of the page because later we're going to be able to, we're going to need to have Brenda share the screen. We'll, so we'll it's on, on share. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Great job. You guys. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Yes. So, um, so we did not take a roll call, but I think everybody could see on the zoom call who's on it. So, um, next meeting, we will definitely get back into that uh, stride. I left it off for some reason. I apologize. I, I think but, we should do that because Sheila is on the phone. I don't know if she can see everybody. So maybe if you oh, just list who's here, okay. that would be helpful. So, Laura and Suzanne Testani. Mary Ellen Gavin. Marty, Joe Krejci. I'm sorry, maybe we both spoke. Joe Krejci. Loretta J. Brenda Steele. Lori MacArthur. Joe DeMarco. I think we're just missing Carolyn, who has been, I think, participating through the phone. Exactly. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Herb and John, it was so wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you again. Carolyn, can you please, under old business, give us um, your report on the Board of Health? Can you hear me, Carolyn? She's been having some trouble um, unmuting mm. on the call. I don't see that. Okay. Okay, we, we might need to come back if she can get on there. Okay. We'll then go down to commission on disabilities and Loretta, I believe you're going to give us a report or a Julie. I think Julie is. I sure. Okay. We had our 1st meeting on Tuesday. It's a wonderful commission. Um, we elected officers. Our chair is Ron Piccolo. The vice chair is. Um, Alder Crocker and the secretary is Karen Roseman. Um, we will be meeting every other month. The next meeting is March. Um, the, it's the second Tuesday of March. Sorry, I have my calendar that close. Uh, March 8th. March 8th is the next meeting. Um, I'm excited because you'll remember that um, Sacred Heart students, OTPT students, did a capstone project, several capstone projects for us. And one of them last year was to look at what other commissions were doing. And um, they're going to review whether or not those commissions succeeded in what they were taking on, you know, in different communities around Connecticut and also look and see what items those commissions are looking at this year to try to help the group, um, you know, form a charge and, and get a sense of what they would like to accomplish. Also at the meeting was Tom Bremer, who is the ADA compliance officer. Um, and he will be attending those meetings. Um, so it was, it was a really great start. Um, you would be very happy with the, the makeup of the commission and the hard work that, that our commissioners did to get that together, um, it, it would do your heart good to know that it, it really will be working out well. So thank you for all your hard work on that and um, stay tuned. I do think, Laura, at some point we should talk about having a liaison to that committee and having, I mean, commission and having a commissioner of from the Disabilities Commission and liaison to this commission. So um, we can talk about that um, you know, maybe we'll put that on the agenda next month. Let them get their feet wet. Maybe, maybe a little bit later. Let them get their feet wet and and go from there. Just to the point of information, is that a is that a new committee or new commission? And does that, other than reporting out to us, does that relate to our commission? That is a great question, Marty. It's the commission came. The new commission on disabilities came was born from this commission that there was this commission identified that there is a need and um, a gap in representation um, and this commission much as it tried to address all needs couldn't so there was a subcommittee um, formed on this commission on the human services commission that um, worked for years trying to identify where what those areas are that needed attention and then um, under Loretta's leadership, we were able to formulate the plan for a commission and um, the first select woman appointed the commission, approved and appointed, the board of selectmen approved the commission. They were appointed and it's a brand new commission. So it, it, you're, it's like your cousin. 
Okay. <laughs> Would they be reporting back to us on a regular basis or how, how will that work? Is that structure set up at this point? No, that would that would be why it's an equal commission. That would be why they would we would want to maybe have a liaison. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank thank you very much. Great question, sir. Yeah, because I had the same question because uh, in looking at the charter, uh, I didn't see any mention of the disability commission in it. Right, and it's so, brand new. not yet. It's just, not yet, but I mean, I'm just saying that should be one of our comments, shouldn't it, to this? Because uh, if it's not a, um, and I hate to be legalistic about this, but if it's not specifically mentioned in the charter as a commission, then are you a, a duly uh, uh, enabled commission? I think that that's, that's why I was confused, too. And even the language in the current charter talks in terms of um, what our uh, authority extends to and extends to uh, people uh, people with special needs. So that's why I, I think, uh, well, maybe I'm jumping ahead, Laura, and I apologize, but I think that's a, a comment that maybe bridges over to our discussion of what the charter should stay. Because right now, the Disability Commission is not mentioned in it, and I think it should be. So, uh, Laura, do you mind if I jump in? It's true. I want you to, yeah. Great. So this commission is approved for is a temporary commission for three years. It is not in the charter, and it is not it, while the charter is open. If it, it would be time to add it in there, but the commission really needs to um, demonstrate a need for a permanent commission, and they have three years to do that. So it's not in the commission right now. You're right. It it probably will not be added in this round of the um, well, as the charter is open, but. When the commission um, demonstrates the necessity for itself, and I and I truly believe it will, then it will go through town bodies to be added um, by ordinance to the to the charter. So um, that's all part of that plan. It's it's that was the way we could get the commission started and working quickly was having it as an appointed temporary commission. Okay, and you, and you will be, I guess, working with the human services department. Like we are, yes. as far as policy making matters involving special needs folks, is that basically what you? Um, uh, yeah, what yeah, yeah, it's definitely attached to to this department, um, and it, it it truly will operate similarly to this commission. Okay. Great. Good questions, though. Excellent. Uh, Loretta, or I'm sorry, Julie. Anything else to add? Did we get Carolyn back? Okay, it does not look like it. I know we um, had her for a few minutes. <laughs> she's up there. She's that dark space there, that black hole that yes. Carolyn is stuck. Should we just um, pass till next meeting then for that report, Julie? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, the next um, area under old business is the comments to the charter. Um, granted, this has been a longer than normal meeting for us usually, um, you know, but yes, very yes. valuable. Madam, Madam Chair, yes. Suzanne Fistani here. Um, yes. I was looking at under 1016 item A, that final sentence, the Human Services Commission in matters which concern the conditions and needs of aging and handicapped persons. And if you progress down to um, item C with number one, it just seems to encompass more age group and level of abilities. Am I wrong? Seems like those two items don't gel. So are are you giving comments? Is that what you're doing, Susan? Yes. That, yes. Okay. Thank Before you. Go there, excuse me, um, Laura. If I may, I just want to talk about the time. I know you started to bring that up. I have a five right. thirty um, hard stop for another call. So right. want to. Well, that's what I was going to put to this meeting commission right now. I have several comments for the charter in front of me. You all probably do. We want to certainly give it the, the right time and, you know, comment. Ready ability. So I was going to ask you, Julie, would it make sense maybe to push it to our next month's meeting because. We've already been here now over an hour, or should we start and then have a, a hard stop, say at 540 
what's the best way to handle it? If I if I can ask John Wynn about this, John, I'm thinking if people have comments and ideas as a member of the Charter Revision Committee, would it be best for them to send directly to your committee their comments? You know, so that we don't necessarily need to discuss people's ideas or concerns about it. We've we've addressed we've tried to change the language already to um, substitute handicap for people with disabilities, make it people first. But would it be um, would that would be the process that you would recommend that comments be sent directly to you? John? Well, I, the comments should go to um, if you look at the, the Charter Revision website, CRC at Fairfield, I don't know if it's CT or whatever, but it's on our the Charter Revision Committee's webpage. Mm -hmm. My view would be that if you each individually sent a comment, they could get lost. I would advocate for aggregating the comments on the part of the Human Services Commission uh, and then submit it in mass because I think it would allow easier integration of it and would give it its greatest emphasis rather than uh, several individual comments. Um, I don't know if it's something you need to vote on as a commission, but I would bet you, you probably would all be mindful and think in a similar fashion and the chair and vice chair probably could collect them evaluate if any needed to be followed up on and then submit them and then come back to your commission to present to you what you, they decided as chair and vice chair and secretary to submit. It might be the fastest pass, path and the most impactful manner to do it. I think it's a great idea. I, you know, I guess my great. for you commissioners is, um, are, do we need to to present as a unit and vote on them, or can we filter or funnel those comments to Laura and Suzanne as vice chair and have them send them to the committee? I'm not sure we need to to vote on them. That you need to vote on them, but that's that's entirely up to you. Um, but I, I do was, love the Julie, idea. This is just Joe, uh, and I'm sorry, Laura. I don't mean to jump in, but uh, being a new member. Um, Maybe a lot of the questions I have are more clarification issues about what the commission should be doing. And I, I understand and I agree with John as far as sending one set of comments back to the charter com, uh, committee. I think that makes absolutely a lot of sense. But I guess what, what I'm thinking of is if we all send our various comments to to Laura, we may have coming from different sides, different comments and I don't know if just sending them via email works. Um, is there a time frame, John, where we have to give our comments to the charter? Is it by the end of February or um, I mean, can we wait to our next meeting to discuss our comments? Because I'd like to hear other people's uh, particularly. Um, I had the same comment about the confusion as far as that sentence in the in, uh, in, in section 10.16. And I like to hear other people's comments about that. So I don't know if just sending emails to Laura and to Julie would work. I think we would need to be face to now I maybe we can't have face to face meetings on this thing, but I think we need a meeting so that we have all of our so we're all on the same wavelength, so to speak, as far, far as what we think the uh, the charter should be. Well, and that's what this meeting was designed for today for those comments. Mm -hmm. So question, Julie. Would we would it render a special meeting before February or to Joe's question, John, do we have time to wait till our next month's meeting? I think you probably have time, although I wouldn't suggest delaying it too long. Um, I mean, the charter revision process is going to go on through April or so, but the quicker we have information, the more readily the advisors that we have can help us get it best implemented into what a revised charter would be. So I would say you probably have enough time, but time is not endless and um, getting it done sooner, I would say is better than too late. All right, so what, how about we have that as our major discussion next month and try to limit the new business? I agree. Instead of having a special meeting, which could get us, let us, have dedicate our time just for the special meeting to discuss this. Well, if your input is provided even in draft form to the charter revision and indicate you're going to come back by date certain, whatever it is after your meeting with 
a final version. It might give the Charter Revision Commission the opportunity to evaluate the implications of what you're suggesting and requesting. I, I put forward a motion to have a special meeting that allows us to have so most of my comments are are texts that may or may not be agreed upon by others, but I've got some comments that I really think are discussion worthy and I would make sure that we have really have the time to to think about and talk talk about and have a thoughtful conversation among us and and think about and come back to it, even have a follow up conversation again. And the are idea you proposing a special all. meeting to before our next month's meeting, Loretta? That's my that's my that's my suggestion. To put forward. I, I would second that suggestion if that's in the form of a motion. So that's Joe seconding with Sheila. Loretta's proposing and Joe seconding. So just a charter comment meeting. Yep. And and Julie, when would that be? Uh, that's up to you guys. Able to have. You do need to have a vote, and then we can try to schedule it. Um, but we have to. We would have to post that. So it, um, you know, we'd yeah, have to. And, and and based on that, would we have to have full participation or not? But to to vote on something, you'd need a quorum. Yeah, you need a quorum. Yeah. yeah. All right. Can we take a vote? All in favor. Aye. 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 Not. Aye. Who's that? Lori. Okay. <laughs> so we have um, seven in favor and one not, and Carolyn is absent. So I say it passes, right? Right, so in favor is Loretta, Marty, Laura, Mary Ellen, Barbara, Suzanne, Joe, Joe and Lori. And no, Lori's um, not in favor. Lori's not in favor? No. I am in favor. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Who yes. raised their hand? Not in favor. Nobody? Okay. I'm sorry. Misread it. And we in favor. Okay. Okay, so okay. we need a date. Um, do we want to we stick to set a date? Is this time frame next Thursday amenable to everybody or? I'm not available on Thursday, but okay. the following Thursday, the 10th, I am. I lost you, Madam Chairman. I'm asking, does next Thursday work for everybody? Loretta said it does not work for her. Does it have to be at a four o'clock time frame for everybody? Or could we maybe do a morning? I'm wondering if we could send out a like a document oh, to get everybody's schedule to see what the best time to meet is rather than um, circle around now. Set it up here. Very good. Okay. And I'm gonna hop. May I please excuse myself, Madam Chair? I'm sorry. Yes, no problem. Thank you, Loretta. Have a nice evening. You too. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to send out an email to everybody uh, garnering best schedule and, you know, rather than keep putting it off off off. I, I would like to say, let's do it within 7 to 10 days. Right, right. Yes. Good. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I don't know, John, I mean, since you're involved in the charter, would you want to be involved in that meeting as a, you know, a, an observer or not? Uh, I think the comments should best go back to the Charter Revision Commission in total so that I'm not applying undue views on, on something. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. All right, on to new business, Senior Center membership fees. All righty, so in a second, Brenda is going to share her carefully prepared document that compares Senior Centers in Connecticut Membership fees for residents, non residents, and also fitness class fees. We thought you did it. What we're trying to, to, to determine is we, um, Julie, we, it's John. I'm going to jump. Thank you all. John. I have another Thank meeting you. I have to get to. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Bye. I have to get off as well. Thank you, John. Okay. Bye. Bye, Lori. Thank you, bye, Lori. Thank you so Thank much. You. So, uh, 
we um, would like to propose a membership fee for out of town um, members. And um, separately, we want, would like to start charging per class for our fitness classes. So um, that requires, it's, since it's a policy change, that requires support of the Human Services Commission. Just as a matter of background, for the last two years, of forever actually for membership and fitness classes, we have not charged. We, there was a charge for pickleball, um, but we, you know, we've been closed. So when we did reopen, we allowed them um, pickleball players to come in, and it was free. Everything has been free, other than lifelong learners and an occasional class here and there. Um, for two years, we've provided fitness classes and paid our instructors and not charged anyone. And it, it just if it feels as though we um, need to change that model. We have it's not sustainable, and we are one of the as you'll look through, we're um, one of the only centers that does not charge the membership fee. Several are free to residents, but to non-residents, and also for fitness classes. So I'm going to send this over to Brenda to um, go over this. I think you're muted, Brenda. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. While I was sharing the screen, I kind of was figuring it out. Um, anyway, so as you can see from um, you know this this document, you know most senior, as Julie has mentioned, most senior centers do charge for. Uh, just to pause a second. We don't have you up on the screen. The, oh. We don't have your document up anymore. Oh, so I don't. Okay, I don't know how that happened. You know, it's hard to read anyway. So if you can't do both. okay. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, as I was saying, as you can see from most this document, but I'll tell you, most senior centers um, in both our surrounding area and in Connecticut either charge four classes or charge a membership fee for residents or charge a residence fee, uh, a non resident membership fee. So, um, there are only Fairfield and Westport and maybe one or two other senior centers that actually don't charge for anything. So, um, you know, we, we really think that it's, it's, it's time and it's for a nominal nominal charges. What we're, we're talking about, um, to, to do that here, um, at the Bigelow center, um, we're suggesting $3, uh, per exercise class. Most of our sessions are 12 weeks. So. $36 for a class. Um, and it's just for our exercise classes. That doesn't mean we're charging for every single thing that we do. Um, we'll certainly have lots of things that are uh, no charge. Um, um, and that includes pickleball. Um, we're including pickleball in that. Um, and then also charging for non residents a fee of $25 um, a year. Do you, have a break, do you have a breakdown of how many? Participants are non residents versus residents. I, I can I can get that. Julie, do you have a number that you could? I do. I have your head? Head rounded numbers. That's a great question, Marty. Yeah. Um, so if we have right now, we have uh, maybe 5,700 members of that about 2,700 are active, which means they come uh, 4 times a year. Um, mm -hmm. Of that about. And I'm uh, about uh, maybe 800 are non residents. Um, so yeah. roughly a little less than a 3rd are non residents of active members. Um, and something we that I, I just wanted to make sure I mentioned while it was in, in my head. Sorry, Brenda was that if, if somebody is unable, if a resident is unable to afford the class, we certainly would have scholarship money available and we were only charging for activities classes with the exception of pickleball that have instructor fees that we've been covering, that we've been taking out of donations. 
So this would cover the cost of these instructors and pickleball does not have an instructor, but that's a very popular and very um, gym consuming activity. Um, Julie or Brenda, did you get any feel? I know it's hard to ask the question. Well, if uh, you have to pay, would you still come? But did you try to get some sense, especially from the non residents? Would they, you know, are they committed enough that they would, you know, want to pay the $25? You know, have you asked anybody or not no. really? No, and you know, Barbara, it's a great question, but it, when you look through, the sheet about how many if, if our residents go to another town, they pay that fee to take classes and all of these seniors shop around for activities. Right. Um, our concern is more that the residents get more bang for their buck and, and our priority is serving the town of Fairfield. So our residents are free that the not out of towners. We love them, but you know, it, it's okay to have. A fee for them to come to use the town facility. Right. But and I'm thinking about on the classes though too, because I know seniors well. I mean, we used to run a lunch program and you know, even when it was pay what you wanted, there was people who didn't, you know, want to pitch in that that seniors, you know, are funny that three dollars to us doesn't seem all that much, but you know, a 90 year old person, three dollars seems like a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. Not really, you know what I'm saying? But um and it's hard to ask, you know, to say, well, I can't pay that because it seems that that, you know, but it adds up if somebody comes, it's three dollars a class, right? Right. right. You know, and if somebody can't afford it, they, you know, we it's same with our lunch program that all, all they need to do is ask. We don't do an extensive, you know, check your taxes and look at your bills. But right. they would have to ask and that puts the responsibility on them. Okay. Our, our seniors who are taking the exercise classes are um, active, engaged, self-directed. So, uh, you know, if somebody could, couldn't afford it, I, I have no doubt that they would, they would mention it. But I, I think a survey of the seniors, um, I, you know, who's going to say, yeah, I'll pay, you, you know, that, that yeah, worries me a little bit. Yeah. No, I'm not suggesting a survey, yeah. but I just thought informally, if you had people that you mentioned it to, you know, yeah. sometimes you have your go-to people to get a feel from. And uh, mm -hmm. no, I mean, I think you're right compared to everyone else. There's no reason not to, but I just was curious if yeah. you floated it at all to see what kind of flack you would get from it. Well, actually, if I, Julie, if I, can might, I make a comment. Uh, it's, sorry, Suzanne, I, um, it's Suzanne, I just wanted to say one thing about fees and Greenwich um, did not have fees for most of the time. I was the program coordinator there for 13 years, um, but we found that when we instituted some fees and just a quick correction on the Greenwich statistic up there, we did charge for water aerobics. Um, I was able to secure pool space uh, pool time. A lot of times by donation, but we needed the money basically to pay for pool equipment and sound systems and things like that. So there was a $20 charge for an 8 week session while I facilitated the program and I know they still have water aerobics there and I've been gone for years. Um, also, we found that it held the people coming to the classes accountable to the commitment they were making. That's kind of the other side of it. Um, and I just wanted to make a quick uh, comment about that large annual fee that you see for Stanford. Stanford is so dumb. They don't have funding from the city, or at least they didn't when I was still working in Greenwich. I've been retired over four years now. Could have been, could be different now, but they primarily have to raise their own money to run their senior center for the most part, most of their programming. So. That if you can see that $50 fee, I just thought I would make that quick comment. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I'll just add. Can I make a one comment? Class. Oh, sorry. If I, if I may, uh, we just went through this presentation on age friendly and I, I'm just thinking about this thing and um, this uh, granted it's, it's a nominal amount. But it encourages people to come, whether they're from Westport or Shelton or wherever they come from. And I'm just trying to think out loud a little bit about this age-friendly thing, because you know, to me, we have to think of concrete things that we would do to make this town age-friendly. 
And to me, I think the fact that you have a senior center where you're not charging people for certain activities where we think three dollars is kind of you know uh, kind of a, a, a very nominal amount. I just think in the context of what we just heard in that presentation, should we just step back a second before we just go ahead and institute this? I think the residents of the town of Fairfield may be concerned that they are paying taxes, which they would think would go to these services, especially since they've already been provided for free over a number of years. And now to tell them and taxes continue to go up, but in addition to that, they will have to pay a fee for the services offered at the Bigelow Center. I'm, I'm concerned that that would probably result in many fewer uh, attending those services that are provided. And for others, I think they'd be rather upset. Uh, you know, I see that other towns such as Westport and Weston do not charge uh, membership fees for those that are outside of the town. And, you know, so in a sense, I'd be concerned about then Fairfield charging for out of town residents when we could go to Fairfield and Weston and uh, provide, get those services for free. But on the other hand, if we had a charge to be able to cover costs, I would opt more in favor of charging out of town and not charging in town residents that are paying taxes. Um, that's it's a great point, Marty. That Westport has um, out of towners paying a larger fee for those classes, um, for cl for all classes. So they don't charge a membership. They they don't they don't have a membership. It's any anybody right. who can join. Um, I do understand your points about this. I don't feel as though. Um, an out of town membership is a is a is problematic because our seniors go to other towns and, and pay those fees as well. Um, Suzanne's point about people being more accountable because we are in COVID times and we've started requiring people to register for classes. We have limited space in that and what we're finding is that people aren't showing up. So we have, a, you know, we've had exercise classes of 30 people. People sign up and they miss four or five classes. Well, they've shut people out of those classes because they haven't shown up. Um, and it's frustrating. It's frustrating for the seniors who couldn't get into those classes. It's frustrating for us because it, it's a, it's a lot of people who are not able to participate in town or out of town. So, I mean, I, I do get what you're saying. I. I I don't necessarily um, think that it's not worth charging. It's definitely worth the discussion, though. I um, agree with I, that, Julie. Can I just add um, that I that what we are the, as far as the classes go, those as Julie mentioned are classes that we charge for, but we offer a lot of other um, programs and activities and lunches for for free as well. So th what we're charging for is only are only those classes that we actually pay. And instructors for so just I just wanted to make that note. And what about your art class too? We talked about that last month, Brenda. You have to pay that instructor as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. And and do people do pay readily for the art class and for um, lifelong learners? Um, so they do. You know, people will pay for those classes they want to pay for. And our lifelong learners, they pay an annual fee, and then for the classes in addition. So people are not averse to paying for those services they get. And, and if the budget would not allow for you to provide those services with the existing uh, revenue, would it make sense then to require a charge a lower fee for residents of the town of Fairfield and a higher fee for those classes for those that are non-residents? Um. I, you know, Marty, I don't know. I, I think we, we were comfortable with proposing to charge non-residents the membership fee in order to allow residents to not have to, to pay that and to supplement some of those other programs, like when we have luncheons or barbecues um, and to have some revenue in the town. Right, party, yeah, I mean, there's and supplies. Yeah. Trips. So, um, yeah, we charge for trips. We don't, we right. don't do those free, but, um, yeah, yeah, this is Mary Ellen. I'm kind of agreeing with Marty on this. Um, you know, I, I think out of towners, absolutely, you know, we should be charging them. But, you know, our seniors proportionately in town 
don't get as much as some of the other age groups. You know what I mean? And this is something that we've provided to them. They've enjoyed. I understand the, the frustration of the no shows. And so something along the lines, perhaps of if you don't show up 3 times, you're out. You know what I mean? And your spot will go to someone else on the wait list. You know, maybe a policy like that for our Fairfield people who aren't showing up for the exercise classes. I fully support charging people from out of town, but I don't know if I, I don't know how I feel about charging our seniors. You know, they're paying taxes, their groceries are going up now. They've been socially socially isolated for two years. We're trying to encourage them to become more involved. And then, you know, to us right now in our age group. Dollars a class isn't much, but I work a lot with the super elderly and they don't necessarily come to your exercise classes. But sometimes when I mention things to some of those super elderly, the 1st thing is I'm on a fixed income. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. I, I am concerned about that, especially now that they have been going through such a crisis these last 2 years um, that all of a sudden we're reopening up and now we're going to start charging for something that we haven't charged for before. Um, right. Yeah. I, second, I second what Mary Ellen saying, like I have found when we're working with seniors of late, you know, even to go to a program that we know costs money, we often have to tell the senior it has no charge and the ch the daughter pays for it or whatever, because the senior just isn't willing to go if there's a charge, you know, I know my 95 year old mother in Florida. We looked into something at the Jewish community center. It's like a year fee of, I think it's $80 and she wouldn't go when she heard it was $80. So now 2 years later, we told her, oh, with COVID, there is no fee and we paid the $80 and now she's willing to go because she thinks it's free. Um, so, unfortunately, there's that mentality, you know, and, and I think, especially now with COVID stuff. It's like the seniors are really feeling scared, you know, they go and uh, I don't know. It's just to me, I, I'm for what everyone's saying, charge the out of towners. I'm not so sure about the others unless you question, say, does this have to be voted upon by our commission or this is something you're just proposing and sharing with us. Um, if, well, if the membership fee would need to be voted on. I just want to point out that our average uh, um, attendant for exercise class is 74. So that's not going to be your super old. We're um, thinking of at the beginning of the fiscal year. I completely understand what you're saying. Um, I, I feel like the change is hard, but as you look through all of these towns that are charging for classes, it's working and every town has frail elderly, every town has fixed incomes. Some have lower incomes than our average people. It's, um, we do have the policy. If you miss two classes, you're out. But, um, and, and, you know, it, it, it's, it still doesn't work. It, you know, there's still, because it's somebody missing two classes, coming back somebody else missing two classes. It's, it, you know, I, I, I do understand what you're saying. I, I definitely get it. Um, and if, I'm, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I could just add, oh, sorry. No, I, I was just going to add to attracting. We've, we, we have some really great instructors and to that end, you know, attracting really good and qualified and engaging um, instructors for our seniors, like anything, you know, you pay for what you get. And so right. being able right. to attract wonderful um, instructors that some of this age group, um, that is participating in the exercise classes because you can go anywhere, you know, the fitness scene around. So we do also want to keep our, 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 our members here if we can with some good instructors and really great uh, exercise programs. This is Mary Ellen again. And if I, isn't if that something that, isn't that something though, that we could perhaps um, go to the town and you know, this is budget season. You know, do we increase our budget pay for these classes? Again, our seniors, um, our seniors really, you know, they've supported this town for years and now, you know, I, I, and I feel that they don't get a lot, a lot from us. You know, when you, and, you know, when you look at some other departments or divisions, they're getting quite a bit of the tax revenues going towards their programs. And when you look at the number of population we have as seniors, how much are they getting towards, towards it? You know what I mean? And so I, I, I just not really comfortable. I get about charging and, and attracting good help. But I also get 
that, you know, it's budget time and that, you know, our, is the senior center center getting their fair amount of a budget? And is this a budgetary question that we need to go to or whoever does that go yeah. someplace and say, we need more funding to provide these programs or to finance. Yeah. I mean, to, no, no, to that's, that's point, thing. I did the math and 800 people times 25 is $20,000. And if you take a, you know, a percent of those 800, because not everybody out of town participates right in everything. I think she brings up a very good point. Uh, I know a few people that take well, their I, fitness classes now, and I could tell you not one of them would pay extra. That's that's a member of the senior center right now, and I'm not well, going to mention names. Can I can I just say uh, also that sometimes we found our populations of seniors, you know, 55 and betters that were using the Greenwich Senior Center would sometimes see that word free. And feel like the program wasn't a good one. We found that we actually had better, pe you know, better amounts of people attending when we did build the credentials and did start to charge a bit on certain things that we did. Um, and what I wanted to add to Brenda is that Greenwich has a little hidden charge that may not have shown up on the radar. They actually charge for parking passes. So it's cut for Greenwich Avenue. So it's kind of a, a little hidden annual membership fee that mm -hmm. they charge. Okay. Just so you know, I don't. <laughs> they're I don't charging. Think we at all, I don't think Fairfield. <laughs> Might not look it, but they are to Greenwich. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you can compare Fairfield to Greenwich at all. Different. Uh, they're actually one of our catchment area towns. Um, yeah. I do want to say about the budget question. I've already put in our budget, and I did not put an increase in for fees and professional services because of the nature of the um, the climate of the budget season now, and I don't think that's necessarily to to give everything away is necessarily a good idea. Certainly we could, you know, we could ask that you vote for the increase in the non-residential membership fee and not do a fitness class fee this year. I get that, but I would want to revisit that next year. Um, I don't think it's, you know, we, to give away everything, um, you know, we don't give everything in, in the schools. I, 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 I'm not uncomfortable charging the three dollars based on the population we know who use the center and those who can't afford it. We would certainly make it available, but I get it. I think it's important to have that non-resident fee, um, and we could use those funds. You know, I don't think we'll get 800 people to sign up for it. Even if we got 500 people, that's a good chunk of change to put in there um, and to be able to use for other services. So I, I do hear you. Um, I'm not 100% convinced yet, but you're the commission and I respect that and I respect the comments and the and the conversation about it. I think it's really important to have. Um, so, so we hold off on that. That's okay. And, and I would have to be if, Julie, if I, if I may, Julie, it's Suzanne um, in reading the charter and part of the charter. I know we're not discussing that right at the moment, but there is a donation component to the charter under the Department of, of Social Services. I would be very willing to make a donation to that scholarship fund where people, if you do, in fact, institute this, implement it. I'd be happy to make a donation towards that fund where people may not be able to pay and maybe that they could tap into that fund and they can not attend. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It sounds to me, Julie, like this is another conversation for another time. There's a lot of input. I mean, I would love to say, hey, it looks like everybody's on board. But I don't think everyone's on board. It, it doesn't sound like that? it. And that's okay. That's why we have to yeah. have these conversations. Yeah. But no yeah. problem with that. Um, All right. I'd so like to I'd like to say let's put it on um our next month's agenda for further discussion and agreement or disagreement, either way. But we're at six o'clock. I actually have an appointment now that I'm gonna have to hop off on. I want to hear your department update though. Um and I appreciate everybody's, you know this patience for tonight in, in hanging in there because you all have great comments. Um, the areas of interest for the commission will, you know, certainly table on the next agenda as well. Um, but I would like to hear your department update, Julie. I know how important that is for all of us. Um, I, I appreciate that. Well, I'll just keep it brief. We have a, a, a new social worker, Kristen Hosk, who is here. Um, the social workers participated in the um, police interviews for new officers as, as long, I mean, as well as the 
racial equity task force. That was exciting. And um, we have been distributing masks and COVID tests. Um, and then I'll pass it on over to Brenda. Um, yeah, we're going to reopen uh, to in person uh, activities uh, next uh, on the 1st, on February 1st. Um, we'll be continuing on Zoom through June and um, lunch and coffee start next week as well. So we're, uh, we've been hybrid this whole time that we've been closed uh, since the beginning of January and all is good. Awesome. So, so is that based on the fact that the COVID um, uh, cases are going down? Is that why you feel confident to open? Yes, we, yes, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Good. I'm happy to hear that. So, Laura, just a point of interest, I would like to, um, so for next month for our meeting, could we have a vote on the member out of town membership fee and we can continue the discussion or just revisit the discussion at a later date on activity fees? It, it, you know, and it, it maybe vote on it. It's, it sounds like that's not going to, that's not something that the commission would support right now, but it, the membership fee, I would love to be able to have that. Uh, approved or not approved so that we could go forward with, with that in our planning for um, July. You're saying I honestly think, yeah, I think we could do both. Mm -hmm. I think we could do both next meeting. Okay. I'm sorry. Talking about, talk about a membership fee for out of town members versus in town members. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Out of town, not in town. Yeah. And, um, Certainly, we're going to get back to everybody by email about a, a special charter mm -hmm. meeting. Hopefully, everybody will be able to be available once we indicate what the best time is based on people's schedules. Um, is there any other business anybody would like to bring up at this time? I, I just want to say I do really appreciate the conversation about these things. This is important for us to be able to hear everybody's voice and know. Where everybody is and I think as a commissioner, we appreciate the opportunity to do so. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, okay. very much so, Julie. This was a fantastic yeah. meeting. Thank you so much. So it too. really was a lot of great input and right. um, everybody was very much, um, so. very much so. attentive. It was wonderful. <laughs> and I appreciate you all very much. And our next meeting is February 24th. Uh, so put it on your calendar, 4 p.m., but we will be in touch about the special charter meeting as well. I make a Great. motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll Thank second you. that motion, Rabbi Barbara. <laughs> Excellent. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank Bye, you, everybody. everybody. Again, have a wonderful evening. Be safe. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.